Let's see. I never know if people are already here watching. Or like when, when it counts on the signing in, but we are making <laughs> blue bread. <laughs> I gotta get the, the music's not loud enough to do my plantain dance. <laughs> Hi Brock! Hey Brock! We're making blue bread today and maybe <laughs> some other dinner too. <laughs> With plantains. <laughs> uh so I got a head start this time because there's a very boring step that's pretty easy. The first step was the first thing you need for blue bread. So let me back up. I gotta re reharness myself here. So blue bread can be very easily made with blue food coloring, which is artificial. But you can also make blue bread with natural food colorings. And before I even get into that, this was all inspired by like the best food we had in Europe, which I'm almost embarrassed to say was from a like chain restaurant. It was a vegan burger restaurant called Flower Burger that's in Italy, and I think they have some locations in other parts of Europe too. But Flower Burger, all their buns are different colors and they're all dyed naturally. So there's like a pink bun, there's a black bun, there's a blue mm. bun and a green bun. And just, we loved our experience there and I loved the idea that they had these colorful, bright fluorescent buns that were flaked, like were colored with natural ingredients. So I thought, I want to try that. And the way, the color that I wanted to make was blue. And the way we get blue is with purple cabbage. So in this pot, I have an entire head of cabbage cooking. I, the only thing, I chopped it up so it's not just the bulb. So the way I prepare the cabbage is I take the bulb, just bulb. I take the head of cabbage out of the fridge. I don't rinse it or anything. I guess you could rinse it. Take it to the cutting board and I chop it. And then I throw it all in a pot, and the chops don't have to be, it could be very coarse. Chop it, discard the stem and the centerpiece, throw it in a, in a bowl, and then rinse it under water and clean it that way. That way you can get all in the, the leaves because they're so tight, because just washing the outside of it, I don't know if that gets everything, so I like to wash everything. Once I did that, I put it in the big pot, and the head of cabbage is about that big. I put it in this pot with seven cups of water, um, I actually measured something for once, and the reason for that is I want to make sure I have enough water to hydrate the bread dough, um, and I didn't want to have too much, so much that it would dilute the coloring. So, in this pot is the cabbage that's been boiling probably for about 20 minutes now, and I think that's probably been long enough, but I'm going to check on the color that we're getting here. Brock just, Brock said, I always heard there was no such thing as blue food. There really isn't. And so you'll see that when we take this out, the cabbage is purple. So check out the color of this. That is pretty purple. That is not blue. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to use some tools. So this is what's really fun about cooking is playing with things like acid and bases. So we learned about that stuff in like school and it was pretty... I don't know, I didn't, none of that really like stuck. I remember like pH, if it's above seven, it's basic. If it's below seven, it's an acid. Um, but that actually affects cooking and food a lot. I've mentioned how, I've kind of mentioned them in and out, and I'll keep mentioning them as I do it, but they, they have different effects on food when you use them. So a good source of acid in cooking is vinegar, lemons, things like that. Tomatoes are acidic. Good sources of uh, a base or alkalinity is um, baking soda. Um, something else you'll see, or sometimes you'll see on like a food bag, is lime. So L I M E. So if you see corn tortilla chips and they say there's um, lime, that isn't always lime fruit. That's lime as in. Um, 
uh, I forget, the, I think it's like, uh, there's a uh, calcium carbonate or, uh, yeah, it's basically like a mineral, actually, that they add to process corn, because it's really hard to process corn on our own, so they have to add something to further process it. So bases break things down. Pretzels are really brown because they add lye, L-Y-E, um, to the dough, which is really basic, which makes the pretzel super, super brown. And this bread actually comes out tasting a little bit like a pretzel, because we're going to use baking soda to change the color. It's like a magic trick. So just turn the, the, the stove, that's what it's called, I turn the stove off, and I'm going to fish out my cabbage. And this cabbage is pretty shot. <laughs> Um, you could probably use it for something, maybe if you have a farm animal, <laughs> like a pig, they might like it. Maybe I'll try and do something with it. Sometimes cabbage smells bad if you cook it too long. This one doesn't smell that bad. Um, but, yeah, I'm just gonna, we don't want any little pieces of cabbage in our, in our bread. Hello, Lauren and Charlie. Hey, guys. Okay. I am... Okay, so the, the other thing here is we want this water to cool off because if we mix in hot, um, hot water into our flour, we cook the flour and we like, cook the bread before it's even cooked. So I've got to wait for that to cool down. And I'm going to try and find a way to cool this down quickly, so that's fun. Because I didn't think about this in advance, I thought I was just going to be good to go from this point. First thing I'm going to do is, is filter, filter this. Angle's not good. Sorry, I wasn't very mindful of my positioning there. But look at that purple cabbage juice. The bread, I'll be honest, the bread has a slight cabbage flavor when it's cooked, but it's not like, ew, this is cabbage bread, but <laughs> it's just been, uh, it's, it's not bad. It's just, there's maybe certain things you wouldn't want to with this bread being mindful that it's cabbagey. Um, I was gonna say like cinnamon and toast, but if you have enough sugar and cinnamon on it, it's probably just gonna taste like sugar and cinnamon, it'll be great. So what I'm gonna do now, the way we cool things fast is I wanna try and maximize the surface area and then I'm gonna put it in the fridge because I know you're all busy people, you don't have time to just sit and watch me stare at cabbage getting cooled down for a half hour. So we're gonna, gonna speed this up for everyone. If you have a very like shallow deep, or not sh a shallow deep tray, <laughs> if you have a, a very shallow long tray, that might be very good for this too. And we're just gonna increase the surface area of the water. Um, so that it maximizes its cool down time because more surface area, there's more convection that can go on and cool off the surface. Uh, another smart thing that I could have done in advance if I thought about it would have been to put the tray in the freezer and then pour the, the hot cabbage juices into the tray in the freezer. <laughs> I can't not laugh when I say cabbage juices. <laughs> Hopefully it makes you smile too. <laughs> Just making some room in the freezer for our hot, our hot cabbage juices. Steamy. Whoa! Be careful when you have a big flat tray of water. It kind of sloshes around and goes off balance pretty easily. <laughs> so I'm gonna 
Brock says, Paul Thompson, a renowned chef, is watching. He wants to know how he can comment. Oh, so to comment, you need a Twitch account, which is free. Um, there's somewhere on whatever your website is, there should be like a, I'm guessing it's like in the top right corner, maybe the top left, somewhere up top. Hopefully, it might, I don't think it'd be at the bottom. There's, there'll be like a login or create account thing. Just create that, um, and that will allow you to just um, to sign up and then comment because I guess it's a good thing. I know it's kind of a bummer to like, I know most people don't have Twitch accounts that are maybe watching this, um, but it kind of keeps out some random spammers. Sometimes we occasionally get some spammers that talk, try to talk to us about things that we just kind of will ignore them. Don't give them the attention that they're not even, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cabbage juice is cooling down. What else? You could like transfer it too real fast. I don't want to add ice because if I add ice to this, it's gonna dilute the coloring, and I want this coloring to be like as potent as possible. So, so I want I want to get this in the freezer too, but I'm trying to find the right vessel. <laughs> oh. Or, or possibly download the app. Oh, okay. If that's, if that's a way to do it, too. Oh, there you go. Now you can really see the purpleness coming through. So pretty. Actually, you know what? We're going to... I'm just going to keep moving this all around. I'm going to change... What am I going to do here? I'm going to change the color first. I might as well do that now, because we can do that now. This is just a chaotic... <laughs> Disorganized <laughs> mess. Whoa. So we're adding everything back because I'm going to do the color changing now because that doesn't matter about the temperature. Because I almost forgot because we don't want purple bread, we want blue bread. So, baking soda. Use baking soda, not baking powder. Baking powder has baking soda in it, but. Um, it's all we need is baking soda. I think baking powder might work, but you might be adding extra stuff to it. Um, no, baking soda won't work because it's got the acid mixed in with the base. So it's just gonna be, <laughs> it's just gonna foam right away and then be neutral. All right. Your dad says if you have ice, you can put the bowl in an ice bath. Oh yeah, I could do that too. That's smart. Good idea. We do have an, well, yeah, maybe I'll make a little ice bath. Okay, so for baking soda, here's our color. I'm gonna keep doing this to change the color. I feel like a chemistry teacher right now. Um, oh, I'm gonna sneeze. Maybe not. We're gonna go with it. <laughs> Went away. <laughs> Try to sneeze without sneezing. Okay, we're gonna add a little tiny bit of the baking soda at a time. I'm gonna another spoon. And let's see what this does. That might be a lot. Okay, I just did a little shake. I forget how much it needs. So we're gonna mix. We're gonna keep, whoa, look at that. It's a little bit, a little bit bluer. So you can see the purple in this bowl. Let's see what this gets us. It's kinda, it's kinda still, it's, it's actually pretty, close to being blue. I think I'm just gonna add a little sprinkling more. I mean, you saw that, that was like, that's how much I still have left in all this water. If we go too far, it's gonna turn green. And there's a way to fix that. But I don't wanna have to, I wanna get it right the first time. You gotta have your proper mixing stands here. You know, so you don't like, you wanna be stable, you don't wanna fall over. So. All right, look at that. Look at how blue that's looking now. How sweet is that? I should have done a little side by side. Okay, next thing I'm gonna do is, that was great for just like this quick test, but I really wanna see what it's like um, when we add flour, because that's gonna absorb the, the water. 
I'm gonna make a little test, flower test. Experimentation purposes. Mm, still pretty purple. Oh, <laughs> Ooh, now it's looking bluer. Brock said, can you explain why this is a preliminary towards you making bread on Sunday? Yes. So, I'm not, when I make the, making the dough is like the hard part about this, um, getting the colors right, tweaking all that. Um, on, we're going to be using yeast to leaven the dough. Um, and that's going to, the yeast takes time to, to work and activate and um, do its thing. So, and then the longer you let the dough sit with the yeast, the more complex flavors develop. Um, even more into that, depending on what temperature you're letting the dough sit at, it changes how the bread tastes. So if it's warm out, like if it's like 80 degrees or something, or 70 degrees, your bread's gonna taste a little bit more sour after sitting with some yeast. If you ferment it and let it sit um, with the yeast for a couple of, um, at, sorry, at a cooler temperature, or you stick it in the fridge for part of it, it's gonna taste more sweet. Um, so in order to get the best flavor and to get the most yeast activity and start uh, make turning the dough into like a foam that's full of air, we're gonna need to let it sit. And that's gonna take at least, I like to let it sit at least 24 hours. So what I make today is just gonna be a wet dough that's gonna then sit, and then we're gonna it's, I'll go through all that, but it's going to sit until Sunday, and then we'll cook it on Sunday. So this water is looking, looking good. I'm just going to, I'm going to go crazy. Risky. <laughs> it's getting better. I need to do another t sample. Sometimes when you rinse the cabbage, um, sometimes when you rinse cabbage under your tap water, it rinses blue, and that's because tap water is sometimes alkaline or basic. It has a high pH. Still turning the dough. Purple it. See, it's gonna take some tweaking to get just right. Getting closer. There's probably a smarter way I can test this other than adding a little bit of this every time. It's actually funny because I, I would have thought it was done earlier with less less baking soda but i'm glad i'm testing it because it's showing me that i actually need to add more each time i do this i mean the color is changing so drastically it's so cool it's so fun i mean this is really fun if you want to, um, it's a great, great little mini science experiment you could do at home. It's kind of like an art, it's kind of like maybe mixing paint. Maybe I'm like the guy at home Depot. I wonder if this is what, what his job's like. Oh, we're so close, so close. A little bit more baking soda. I don't even know why I'm. <laughs> okay. 
because sometimes I don't, this is, this is, I guess, the downside of not planning things too much beforehand, so you guys get to see, but this is good because you get to see how to wing it, so, how to improvise, Just improvised cooking on the spot. Probably up to about a teaspoon of added baking soda now. And it's not gonna look, it's gonna actually come out more blue. It's gonna, it's still gonna look kind of gray when you're cooking it. Um, it's gonna come out more blue when you actually cook it. Sorry, it's gonna look more gray when you're mixing the dough and not very, not very blue. Brock asked, you have no recipe for this? Question mark, you're doing trial and error. Yeah, I'm, well, with the baking soda and the cabbage. And I don't know, I think when I post the recipe, I'll have a better idea of how much. So it'll be like a teaspoon or so of baking soda. But depending on how much water you use, how, what, your, what the cabbage is like, that's probably the greatest factor that might alter things, is how the, how the cabbage, how, how purple the cabbage is. So I think it's, this is one of the things that I think is, is maybe more helpful to understand the fundamentals of what's going on and getting that and using that to then be able to replicate it on your own. Because if I give a recipe and it doesn't, and the color is not right, um, which could totally happen depending on your cabbage and you, how, how, however alkaline your water is that you're starting with. Um, your, your, your results can vary. It's like making color for Easter eggs. You're winging it. Yeah, I think that's good. I think that's what we're gonna do. And just in case you do over add the, um, in case you do over add, bake, let's say you made it too green. So there's our color. Let's say, okay, like let's say you, you made this way too green. I'm gonna add some more baking soda here. It's gonna get super green now. greener you can add vinegar to bring it back so now we're gonna add an acid to bring this back and there's baking soda in it so it's making bubbles so you can see how it turns pink with vinegar it's kind of a fun little thing you could do and the more vinegar you add the redder and pinker the cabbage water will become Look at this chemistry going on. This is so fun. Joy says purple bread is cool too, though. Yeah, maybe another time you could do we could do purple pink bread. Um, I'll have to do that next time, or maybe I could do it this time. Maybe I'll make two loaves. Maybe I'll make a pink loaf and a. Let's see how much water we have. I could always add it later. It's still a little warm, so I'm gonna let this sit a little longer. I love that color. It's like turquoise. So cool. And yeah, like I said, it's it's not gonna look super vibrant when we mix the dough. It's gonna look like a blue gray cloudy sky mush. <laughs> but somehow there's some magic that happens. Last time I did this, I hope it does the same thing as last time. Last time I did this, it was like this blue gray mush, and then the inside when we cut it open, it was like beautiful, vibrant blue. Mm. It's so cool. Um, Brock says starting, it looks like a sixth grade science project. Exactly. That's, cooking is just doing science. It's applied 
applied science. It's trial and error. I mean, I'm doing it all live. That's 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 what I want to do with this cooking thing. It's like just you don't need a recipe. You can experiment. You create your little trials like this guy. You know, just make your little trials, test little pieces, and then scale up. See what works, see what doesn't work, and keep learning. And while that's going, I'm gonna give it about five minutes in the freezer. Uh, yeah, that's where I put it, it's in the freezer. I'm gonna do about five minutes and then I'll continue with the bread. But since we have five minutes to spare, I figured I'd do some cooking of actual dinner tonight. Um, plantains, and we've been on a Puerto Rican kick, so we did, we, what did we do? We did something recently. Um, anyways, oh, I made green banana salad recently, but I don't think I recorded that, so you guys probably have no idea what I'm talking about. But we made green banana salad, and then I did fried plantains one day. Next Sunday, this Sunday, the coming up Sunday in two days, we're going to do um, a vegan dessert with dinner, um, and that's most likely going to either be fried plantains with these guys that are getting nice and ripe, or it's gonna be some like coconut macaroon things that I made that are both super, super easy, super low ingredients. Um, actually, if you want to, maybe we could do that. Like if you wanna cook those with us next week, um, I could shoot out an email um, and see what what uh, what ingredients you'll need, and then you can you can tag along and play along with with us. Plantains might be harder to find, so maybe I'll go towards the coconut macaroon things. But I still want to make these things. Okay, what are we gonna do for? Okay, so Puerto Rico. <laughs> this guy, Shavasana Steve. He goes into all different sorts of yoga positions. He's gonna just chill on the baking soda for this chick, and the mofongo, there's kale, we're gonna do, we're gonna do beans with this. The um, Sunday's also gonna be a bean-free, legume-free meal, so no, no legumes. Um, but tonight is not Sunday, so I'm gonna do legumes. Um, so this is a green plantain, and a plantain's like a banana. Um, in that it looks a lot like a banana, but it's kind of like a potato in that uh, it's like really starchy. And you can eat plantains green or yellow or brown, but you never really want to eat these ripe uh, because they're so starchy um, and more potato-like. So I, I think there's, I forget what the act, like if there's other issues with potentially eating them raw, um, I don't think they're lethal if you eat them raw, so if you do happen to eat one raw, you'll be okay. Um, just try not to eat too much of it, you might get a stomach ache. So right now, you can see it like, the peel sticks to this thing like it's got some sort of super glue, and <laughs> sometimes rip it apart. And I didn't, you know, I was talking when I started doing this, but on the next plantain, because I'm doing two plantains here, I'm gonna explain how to do this a good way, so you're not hacking away at your plantain, um, just making an absolute mess out of it. And yeah, you just want to get all that stuff off. All those little, all that skin, that's that peel. Get out of here. <laughs> all right. I don't know what's going to happen if you ate the peel. Um, I haven't done it haven't researched it, um, but I'm sure somebody's done it and then wrote about it on the internet. So the, the, the better way, the way more better way to do this <laughs> is to like pop the cap like that first and then I just kind of run a slip down. Make sure you got a nice sharp knife. That's actually like one of the most important things when cooking. Like just make sure you have a good knife because you could hurt yourself really badly if you don't have a sharp knife, um, which seems counterintuitive maybe. But when you when you do this, when you give it these slices, it kind of peels off a little bit easier. 
So plantains are, there's a lot of different things you can do with plantains. I'm, I'm gonna make something that's kind of similar to mofongo, which in, like a, it was a Puerto Rican thing. I had it in Puerto Rico and in, mofongo is fried mashed plantains, usually mashed with garlic, served with typically meat. It's like steak and potatoes, but a Caribbean version of it. Um, also served with like a, uh, oh, what's the sauce called with a, um, the sauce that has olive oil, garlic, and oregano. It's got a name and I'm forgetting of it. And everyone knows this name. It probably doesn't, you may not realize that that's what it actually is. Mm. Uh, I'll come back to you on that. Brock says, what's the difference between banana and a plantain? Banana um, is sweeter and you can eat bananas raw. A plantain is more like a potato. Um, you do not, it's like a lot more starch than sugar. It doesn't really get converted to sugars as much. Um, I don't know how the tree is different. Oh, fun banana fact. Bananas are actually berries. Um, I didn't know that. They're botanically a berry. Autumn, do you remember what the deal is on that? Is it a banana bush too? Is it not a banana tree? Yeah, it's like an... It's an herb. It's, it's an, an herb. herb. That's right. A banana tree is an herb and the banana is a berry. Google it. I, it was in my food book. I believe it. It wasn't even like randomly on the internet. It was in like an actual science food book. Food science book. <laughs> okay. Um, heating up the pan, the cast iron pan. I'm going to put some oil in it. Um, we're getting low on olive oil, so I might do this with coconut oil. Thinking. So normally I'd want to do this with olive oil or canola oil or like a neutral oil. That would probably be best, but I think I'm just going to do coconut because we've got, we've got way more of it. This is pretty close to empty. This is pretty close to full. It's all about balance. Balance just doesn't have to be with the food you eat, but in your processes. So we have balance. That was kind of a stretch, but. <laughs> so now we're just gonna scoop some coconut oil out of here. It's kind of like an Italian ice. It's like this. We use Italian ices. I haven't had those in a while. Aioli? Not aioli. It's similar. Ah, uh, it's not like it's not mojito. It's not. It's a. Mm, it's a. I can't remember. Ah, <laughs> uh, it's gonna bug me now. It's a. Uh... Well, anyways, while I'm thinking of that, this is heating up. I'm not okay. So mofongo for real. This is not mofongo for real. Mofongo for real is fried, deep fried. I think it might even be fried in like pork fat, which would make it even more tasty. Um, but we don't cook with animal meats on this cooking channel. So we cook with plant-based foods. So we're not using that. And I don't like to deep fry that much. Um, I prefer to light fry, <laughs> shallow fry. that thing. It's oregano, olive oil, and garlic. It's got a name. And it's, it's, it's escaped my mind. <laughs> okay, I'm just kind of chopping these up like that big. This is all going to get mashed in the end. In the end, it sounds so grim. Um, I'm going to wait for this to get a little hot. So I'm going to listen for the sizzling. See, it's a little little slow right now. Um, I want to add it when it's hot. Um, it helps prevent the, uh, the plantains from sticking to the bottom of the pan. And people think that if you put stuff in oil too early, it absorbs more oil. If it's not hot enough, it absorbs more oil. And actually the opposite is true. If When you put stuff in really hot oil, it tends to absorb more, but it doesn't taste as greasy. Um, I can't remember the science behind that, but I just remember that fact and it was like, 
done uh, through America's Test Kitchen or Cook's Illustrated, one of those places that's like a legit food science place. Um, so, but just because something tastes greasy doesn't mean it has less fat. It might have been fried in a um, unsaturated fat. Unsaturated fats are like liquid at room temperature. Um, you want to be careful. Uh oh, you want to be careful <laughs> when you're uh, when you're. I'm gonna maybe I'll wash that off and add it anyways. It's gonna get fried. Um, <laughs> you want to be careful when you're dealing with oil. Like very careful. Keep all watery things away from the oil. Never, 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 ever put water on hot oil or anything watery. No juice, no milk, no soda, nothing with water. No wet vegetables because it's just going to splatter and explode and cause fire and things will burn. It's going to hurt. Brock says Paul's a graduate of Culinary Institute of America. Oh, that's, I didn't know that that was where he went. I knew he was a professional. So if you, if, Paul, if you know anything, if you can, if you want to chime in, I'd appreciate an actual expert advice. <laughs> I'm just a, I just make stuff with food. I'm going to try and break these apart to try and fit them all. I know we're kind of crowding up the pool right now, but it's gonna be okay. I'm just like, I'm almost there. I've almost got them all fit. I'm just gonna cut them in half. Again, the size isn't a super important thing. Um, I have them pretty thin because I that helps maximize, reduce the cooking time and maximize the oil penetration of the plantains and the oil is so we, we do them in oil because it's going to make them crispy a little bit it's going to add some fat and richness if you did these in the oven they'd probably just dry out too much um so this is kind of a nice compromise I bet it would work in the oven if you put them in a pan and roasted them with oil on top of them. Just a little bit of oil, much like potatoes. But I'm actually cooking this similar to how I do my potatoes. Those awesome potatoes that I like to make. Mm. Um, except this is definitely more oil. Brock says Paul couldn't figure out how to comment, but texted Brock that you're a natural. Okay. He is a natural. Oh. <laughs> he cooks very effortlessly. That's just the way cooking should be. It's just a flow. It's just a, like a little dance. A little dance. Like my dance with the plantains earlier. <laughs> okay, so I gotta dry this off a little bit. See, you hear that? the water, it's angry, it doesn't like water in the oil. Alright. I'm gonna turn that heat down. Let me check on them. I wanna like the first ones I put in, I want them to get like a golden brown on the bottom. Yeah, kinda like that. Let me just kinda go through and flip them all. The heat's on a medium heat now. Feel like okay, that's good. No, bring this over a little bit. And I think it's kind of hard to overcook these. Um. So you just want to make sure they're they're nice and soft when they're done. That's that's ultimately what you're looking for. You want it to be a little golden brown. That one. Flip back over. Get back over there. Get back in there. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Okay, we can check on our food. Let's see how our frozen, hopefully it's not frozen, our nice, ooh, it's nice and chilly. Uh, 
Definitely not gonna cook our flour. Let's add this back in here. And I'm going to the side. What I'm gonna do next. It is just getting wild in here. Okay. <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes I don't know what I am doing. We have flour somewhere. Hmm. Where is it on? Okay, there it is. It's in here. There it is. Oh. These are the Laurel Islands. Are they whole wheat? Or are they white wheat? We don't know. Okay, so we're gonna do, we're gonna use white flour. So bread making. Okay, bread making time. And people are gonna hate how I make, there's a million ways to make bread on the internet. There's a million recipes out there. Bakers will probably hate the way I bake bread, but that's why I'm gonna do it anyways. Because I like baking bread this way. I'm gonna try and be the champion of multitasking right now. So I'm flipping plantains and making bread and narrating. Trying my best to keep you entertained. I think the more things I have going on, the more entertaining this might be. Um, it gives me more to talk about. And it, I, it, it helps reduce lulls in the, in the broadcast. Look at that lovely golden brown. See, bananas are a lot mushier. Bananas couldn't, couldn't do this unless they're like super green. We're just gonna let those guys chill some more. Chill some more on their coconut oil. Coconut might make this a little sweeter than the original dishes, um, but it's okay. You can make things work with what you got. He said both credited Paul for his initial interest in cooking. I did, yeah. Paul was the shrimp scampi was the first thing I learned how to make, for real. Shrimp scampi, I don't remember how old, I must have been in like 7th or 8th grade, and it was really good, and that's what, that was my first real thing. And then I kind of downgraded, I went to Kraft Macaroni and Cheese, but then in college I got back up, I like went back up again. It's kind of like, first interest was like this real professional meal, and then I went to Kraft Macaroni and Cheese, just kind of leveled out there, cut off, and then make a little graph of my cooking I mean it's never up here actually so this is it's actually three-dimensional I would say this is like <laughs> there's a third axis that comes out this way that's just more chaotic so like it started here and this is like the 2d plane and then it comes out this way and then this part is up open to interpretation maybe there's a fifth axis <laughs> I mean a fourth okay the first thing I am gonna do is add my flour, and you can measure. Um, most doughs are, doughs can be like anywhere between, oh, you guys see my feet like doing the cross thing? Okay, most doughs are, I think like 70 or 80% hydration, something like that. Um, the best way to make bread is to look up a recipe for the, that has the amount of flour in grams or ounces, and then get a scale and weigh things out. Um, that's the best way to make a bread recipe, but I like to make bread more artistically than scientifically, so I take flour and I add however much flour I think I will want my bread to have in it. <laughs> so I just kind of I don't know, this is a couple cups of flour. And don't worry, I'll, I'll have an actual recipe on the website. I might even just link to the one that I learned how to make bread from, because I that was really my base, my starting point. Um, I mean, this is so much water, I can just, I'm sure this is gonna hydrate the whole thing. Good. Well, let's just start with that. I could always add more. Next. Oh yeah, these. Um, they are really looking awesome. Nothing is burning yet, and we want to keep that from happening. We don't want this to burn. 
hopefully there is never a, the yet. If we get to the yet and they start burning, then we have to start over. That's one of the few things that's hard to come back from is burnt food. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you could just... Some, there's some people like my mother that like their food very burnt. Beth says it looks incredible. Thank you. I hope it tastes incredible. I mean, it's pretty hard to not. I mean, you're just frying up this wonderful banana thing. That's, it really doesn't taste anything like a banana. Um, I don't think that this is going to be like fried bananas. Um, it's really more like a potato. It's like starchy like a potato, but it's got its own little flavor. If you go to Trader Joe's, you can go get plantain chips. They come in a long, thin little purple package for the like yellow and just like a little monkey on them. They're really good. They're just fried plantains that are cut thinner than this and fried. Um, those are, that gives you a pretty good idea of what a plantain's gonna taste like. Those are green plantains. Yellow plantains will taste more like a banana. They'll have more of a sweet, sweet flavor with them. Okay, back to the bread. Um, I'm gonna wash my hands and do a quick little like finger temperature test. Just to make sure the Water is below like 100 degrees, um, so if it feels like it's too hot to go in, like if I like put my finger in, I'm like, I don't want the rest of my body going in that, it's gotta go back in the freezer. But if I put it in and it doesn't feel that way, then we're good. Cause that would kill the yeast. I washed my hand and there's like a little hair on it. Okay. Oh yeah, it's like ice cold, perfect yeast. I have these little packets of yeast. We use dry active active dry red star yeast. It's brought to you by um, the ingredient. I like this brand because the ingredient is just yeast. A lot of these places and this is one of my pet peeves will have like stuff added to it and I get that it's like added for a reason or whatever but I just want yeast. I can add all the other stuff that I need so this is active dry yeast. This is a living organism. Um, well, when it gets active, um, it's gonna activate in water. This is a living thing, and it's going to um, bring our, our bread to life. And I'm not measuring the yeast either. I'm just adding about that much yeast. So it's maybe like an eighth of a teaspoon. Because it's a living organism, it's gonna reproduce and it's just gonna grow. That's why this bread tastes a little bit longer. And it's also not gonna taste yeasty. If you've ever had bread that tastes really yeasty, you didn't let the yeast sit long enough or your yeast is dead and it didn't do anything. So that's when bread dough tastes yeasty. That's what's going on there. All right, and then salt. I like add such a pitiful amount of salt. I really don't, don't do much salt. So we keep everything pretty low salt. I mean, this is like not even an eighth of a teaspoon. I just sprinkle it in. This is also like unheard of in baking recipes. Usually there's like a ton of salt in bread. You can add salt later. The bread's gonna be fine. If you add too much salt, it inhibits the yeast growth, which means that the yeast isn't gonna be able to grow um, or it's gonna grow more slowly because it's just too salty. Um, I just do that. I'm gonna mix all the dry ingredients and now I'm gonna add my blue water a little bit at a time. We got a good angle here. How's our angle, Autumn? Mm -hmm. It's good. Like I said, this is gonna actually look more gray than anything else. It's gonna kind of look lame and sad. And I am going for a consistency more than anything here. The goal is a dough consistency. And the consistency I'm going to look for is definitely thicker than like a pancake batter. Um, but it, it still holds itself together. So I've got a little too much dough, I mean water right now. So I'm going to add a little bit more flour. Like I said, it's it's kind of like this boring, bland gray. But it's going to brighten up. 
in the future. And you don't need to actually knead this dough or anything. This is a no knead dough. Um, the more you knead dough, the point of kneading dough is to develop gluten. Gluten is a bunch of proteins that um, our gluten is formed from proteins that get aligned and basically make the dough stretchy. There's actually very few foods that are like stretchy. Like they get stretch. A lot of foods just break apart. That's why we use white flour. White flour has more capability to make gluten than whole wheat flour. Um, that's why whole wheat flour is typically more dense. Uh, some of these got a little bit overdone, but that's okay. See, sometimes I let things get away from me, but looks like only a few are going to have to scrap. But quickly, I'm going to take this and I'm going to pause this operation. I'm going to come back to this in a little bit. Oh yeah, that would work. My lovely film girl has all of the tools readily available and can help assist. I'd be lost without her. <laughs> so this is what it looks like when you cook them a little too much. See, this one's perfect. I don't want to touch it because it's got hot oil. That's a golden brown that we're looking for. That's what we want to avoid. So when you're doing this, I best advise that you don't try and film yourself talking about how to make bread when you are frying plantains. <laughs> but we're actually still, I'm, it's just the outside that's like kind of crispy. So it's not like this is gonna go to waste. Um, I'm still gonna be able to use a lot of this. Um, but I wanna get this blue bread ready for you guys because that's the main thing, that's the priority today. Everything else is second to the blue bread. That's the real interesting thing going on here. If I screw this up too bad, we could just do plantains again another night. All right, there they are. They're gonna sit here. Normally I'd mash them with garlic when they're hot like that, but there's blue bread that needs to be made, so. Still a little bit too sticky. So just keep adding flour until it gets less sticky. You can see now it might be a little too dry because it's kind of full. It's, it's actually, no, it might be okay. It's kind of folding over itself, but I might want it to be a little bit wetter anyways. So I'm just gonna mix this more thoroughly. Add a little bit more of this, just tweak it. I do want it to be more wet too because I think that's just gonna make it more blue. And you can definitely let the dough be, um, you can definitely have a wet dough like this. Yeah, this is, this is what I want to see, right like that. So you can see it's not a pancake batter where you can like pour it. It's still, it's still got some, some structure to it. It could be even a little bit more dry. Again, I'm making this a wetter dough than normal because I want there to be more blue. Another thing you could do is if you have a lot of extra of this stuff, of the colored water, you could boil it more. Boiling it more is going to concentrate the coloring more. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. That might have vinegar on it. It's going to throw off our colors. Let's take a new spoon. Okay, this is the last step for the blue bread. Once you have it mixed up, again, just thoroughly mixed. You don't have to go through some kneading process or anything. It's gonna look like this. What we're gonna do is take a um, a towel and we're gonna like incubate it. So here's my little blue towel. 
you know, get it nice and warm with some hot water. Like, imagine you're sick and you just want a hot clap, like cloth over your head, or uh, you're on an airplane, they offer you a hot towel, like that temperature. We gotta wait. We get some really hot water though, like this is gonna burn me if I'm not careful. <laughs> it's also like super, if you, haven't, if you haven't seen our water pressure, hang on, I'll show you that water pressure in a minute. It's really impressive. Um, You can see it's just steaming. I just squeeze it to get the whole towel nice and wet. And there's our bread. And we're just gonna let this sit now for overnight. I'm gonna keep checking on it. And it's gonna look, we're gonna start to see little um, bubbles forming and things like that. It's gonna start to get bigger. And I'm guessing probably around tomorrow around this time, I'll, I'll, it'll be a little bit built up and I'll come over and I'll hit it with a spoon not like violently, but just like kind of like, <laughs> like push it with gently with a spoon, to like and then just give it a little mix. Get the towel wet again because the towel is gonna dry out, and then put it on the counter again. Stick it somewhere warm, preferably. That's gonna help the yeast activity. Um, I said that's gonna make a more sourdough, but it makes it happen faster. So I definitely want this to be ready by um, Sunday. So I'm gonna try and stick it somewhere warm. We're in San Diego, so it's pretty easy to find a warm spot and like and then we just <laughs> we uh we're gonna wait and then you'll see it on Sunday again if you're if you're there on Sunday but just to be out of the kitchen to maximize on space I'm just gonna set it there for now normally we keep it in the kitchen <laughs> but we got a lot going around John, going on in the kitchen I can't even speak the words are starting to be a more difficult to say and I need garlic because that's the next ingredient for, well, this, this we have, I'm going to do something with this later. Maybe I'll make another blue bread. Maybe I'll turn it pink, do a pink bread. I got to finish the mofongo. So that's more <laughs> urgent, but we can store this cabbage juice. have jars. I guess we're using all of our jars, so it's gonna go in a bowl. <laughs> oh, look at that, it's kind of fun. <laughs> look at our counter. Look at that. That's so pretty. I love that color. All right, we'll come back to you another time. Maybe I'll make a, maybe I'll make a second batch after all this is over. You guys saw the idea. Maybe I'll add vinegar and we'll make a pink bread. Yeah, that sounds fun, I'll do that. But you guys don't need to see that again. You saw how that was done. We got mofongo. <laughs> we got garlic. I'm gonna move things along here. This to serve its purpose. We got kale in the dugout, waiting for action. Don't worry, kale. You're gonna you're gonna get get to play soon. Sorry, I don't know why I'm giving baseball references. I don't like baseball particularly. So this is garlic that I am peeling by squishing with my own weight. You don't need a fancy garlic press um, all the time. Sometimes it's nice to have a garlic press. That's kale, that's not skin. Uh, uh. <laughs> garlic can be a pain in the butt to peel sometimes. It just sticks to you and... This garlic's actually being pretty good. Normally I have much more difficulty the garlic sticking to my fingers, but I must have done something. Okay, sometimes this garlic's weird, it's got little things like that. See, this is the kind of stuff they never tell me in like cooking shows on TV. I just slice that stuff off, because I don't know what it is. I don't know what kind of weird thing is going on with that garlic. And it's such a small amount. But, i just get rid of it. Yeah, they always have such perfect food on the cooking shows, but that's not reality. Reality is we, we don't have perfect food. 
Some foods have little marks on them. Some of those marks are fine, but some of them, I don't know if they are. <laughs> and I don't want to be, I don't want to be the first one to find out if it's not good. <clears throat> and what I'm going to do is, uh, there's still some oil in that pan that we cooked the um, plantains in, so I'm going to saute the, um, the, what's it called? The garlic. Let's go lightly, lightly kind of peek the hole. Brock says you're channeling Bob Ross again. I'm channeling Bob Ross again. I need a fro. I need like a fro wig. I can just be here. Or I can just start some happy little garlic. In our pan. There they are. Look at them all. They're all different sizes. I'm having a, a moment. It's important to give yourself a little moment if you feel like you need it throughout <laughs> the day. Just give yourself a moment if you've been going hard and just. This is starting to sizzle. I'm not looking to burn this. Burnt garlic is way worse than blurnt. Burnt, blurnt, burnt plantains. I'm gonna see how bad this is. Some people like, like this is like a toasted marshmallow. Let's see, I mean, you can see it's barely, it's only on the outside. I'm gonna taste it and see how bad this burntness is. <laughs> That's really not bad. <laughs> Mom, you'd love this. <laughs> I think I will cut it off because burnt is a little bit bitter. And it's carcinogenic, so probably should get rid of the burnt. Um, so I'm just gonna slice that off. And I don't wanna just do the garlic, garlic. I don't wanna do the garlic raw, um, cause garlic is pretty bitter and intense raw. The real awesome way to have done this would have been if I planned ahead and roasted the garlic in olive oil in the oven in aluminum foil at like 300 degrees, just low and slow. I don't really like using the oven very much though because just so much work it just seems like it's just such a big thing to do and it's so slow, even though slow is good. Um, slow is not good for those of us that don't like to plan ahead. Um, Thank you all for watching today, by the way. I know I sent out a very late message, but my planning for life is very similar to my planning for cooking. <laughs> so, we've had a note that said blue bread, Bo make blue bread for like a month. We actually had a of cabbage that we had to get rid of because it got moldy in the fridge because I didn't even make the blue bread fast <laughs> enough. Your, <sighs> your mom said she would love it, mm -hmm. the plantain. Turn that off. I'm gonna prepare our mashing pot. We're gonna do some mashing. Here's a good mash pot. A mash pot. A dash pot. Mass dash pot. Damper. Huh. Engineering terms. Uh, I'll just. Oh yeah, I guess we could put it in an actual thing. I don't know if we're gonna use this cabbage. You gotta watch this garlic, but you can only turn the heat off. It's still, it's still toasty in there. All right, now we just transfer. It's kind of leathery. <laughs> Look at it. Just, it's a little stinky. Yeah, when you cook cabbage too much, it gets a little stinky. I don't know what we're gonna do with this. <laughs> Sometimes we just hang on. Sometimes we just. We'll leave things like around for like a week and if it doesn't disappear in a week then we throw it away. It's a good rule, it's a good practice. You're like uncertain, that way you give it a chance, you don't really feel wasteful because it's like, all right, like we might we might use this. We're not gonna just carelessly throw this away. Um, but by giving it that week, after that week, it's like, all right, yeah, I'm really not gonna use this at all. 
Oh, this is the fun spatula. I'm actually using it backsided right now. So it's gonna do you know, all this stuff. You can go in vertical. It's like, it can be ergonomic like those snow shovels, which are definitely not ergonomic, <laughs> if you ask me. Snow shovels. We're shoveling the garlic snow. I wonder if, I'm not gonna even say it. to filter out all the non-burnt plantains. Can you pickle it? Pickle the garlic? Pickle the, pickle the what? The plantains? We'll see. The garlic, if we're talking about the garlic, that could be pickled. Um, that would help tame the bite. That would be just like keeping it with vinegar. Um, so I could have boiled the garlic with some vinegar. That would have tamed it. Well, these aren't, aren't too bad. Mmm. Oh, look at that. It's like marshmallowy. Mmm. I guess I have to try another bite. Mm -hmm. The cabbage. Can you pickle the cabbage? Oh, the cabbage. I, it's, 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 no, it's a little too far. It's best to do pickled cabbage when it is um, raw and fresh. I do pickled cabbage. All the, I love doing pickled cabbage. But doing it with cooked cabbage, it's kind of, it's not, a, it doesn't like get crispy. It's not. You don't get, it's not as good as, like, good pickled cabbage. It's not as good as good pickled cabbage. <laughs> Someone said burnt bits of garlic means the most flavor. Burnt, so, I have mixed feelings about that. If it's too burnt, it's too, I, I think it's really bitter. Um, but like roasted, slow roasted garlic, that's really good. It will so. go mushy. It would go oh, mushy. Oh, the cabbage. Maybe. Yeah, the cabbage would go mushy. It's cutting off the burnt outside. See, this is how we save things. So there is our protein. Now we're gonna mash it. Um, huh, I don't know if I mash it. Maybe I'll just food process it. I never made mopongo in a food processor. We have it though. This, we're just taking a left turn right now. <laughs> <laughs> I love winging it. I feel so much more it's funny doing this live and like talking through everything. I feel like I have a lot more creative freedom and I feel much more urgent and excited about things that I'm going to try. I normally don't make decisions this fast, but in the name of entertainment, I'm doing it. Someone says put an entire head of garlic in the oven and it will be amazing. Oh yeah, definitely. I love roasted garlic. Not burnt garlic though. Burnt garlic can be problematic. Okay, I'm gonna add some olive oil. Not too much. Just enough to add a little bit of flavor, a little bit more richness. Um, what else is going in the mofongo? Salt. <clears throat> Sauce, M-O-J-O, I think, is the garlic 
olive oil. <laughs> Let's see, I might need to add something to make it more moist. It be too dry. So I didn't add too much oil. Oh no, it's actually pretty. Oh man. Oh, that's so much better than I was expecting it to be, actually. <laughs> oh, I love that. It's gonna start to clump together soon, I think, because it does feel actually pretty moist in there. So we're gonna see, see the mass starting to move around. It's kind of like this clumpy. So remind us, what are we looking at right now, Bo? We are looking at a version of Mofongo for vegans. That is so good. This is like honestly better than I was expecting it to be. I'm gonna feed some to our video, <laughs> video girl. Mmm. <laughs> Her face. Oh, that's so good. Mm. Wow. That was really, okay, it all worked out. <laughs> Next thing I'm gonna do, drain some of this oil. I'm gonna save some of it. Just leave a little, little bit in the pan. Get this little burnt plantain out of there. And we're gonna do some, we're almost done. We're gonna do some kale. Cause you're always adding our leafy greens. I'm gonna throw a little sacrificial piece in that's gonna let us know when the oil's ready. While that's going, I am going to prep the beans. I said pinto beans. Autumn, what do you want? Do we want to do pinto or black beans? We're kind of cheating tonight. We're just doing the canned pinto. I like pinto beans. I hear, I hear the thing. I hear the kale. Kale's fun too, you don't need a knife, you could just you could just shred it. If you have like if you had a rough day and you just need to like <laughs> let some steam off, buy some kale for yourself and give it a good rinse and then just heat up your pan. Make sure it's relatively dry so you're not splashing hot water. Water on the hot oil and just shred it. If you're more particular, you can of course chop it with a knife. That works too. Or if you just like to work with your hands, it's just nice to like really just handle something. Just sitting at a keyboard all day. Or if you're doing the opposite, if you're in in the fields all day, like working with your hands all day, maybe you just want to throw it in the food processor. And you just have a machine do the whole thing. So maybe that's really nice. Kale's going. I just need another taste of this because it's just so good. Mm. My uh, videographer is also, <laughs> hang on, I just need to, I'm going to give her, it's like a little golden, hang on, you guys need to see her reaction to the, so that was it. So that is the mofongo, and again, mofongo, if you haven't seen the beginning of this video, mofongo is fried plantains that get mashed with garlic. Mm. I did it a little differently this time. I mm. didn't deep fry the plantains, I used coconut oil. I actually would have preferred to use a more neutral oil, like canola or something, or even olive oil, because I actually like the flavor of olive oil in this. Um, and 
didn't deep fry them, I sauteed them in a pan with a little bit of shallow oil, I shallow fried them. Um, threw them in the food processor with garlic that I sauteed um, and a little bit of oil. Again, if you had garlic and that you could roast in the oven, that would have been awesome too. If you really like garlic, throw in like a whole bunch more garlic. I just threw in like four or five, five, five or six cloves. Um, mash it all up, add a little bit of salt and olive oil, and that is really, really, really good. It doesn't taste like anything I've ever had before. Yeah, it's, that's, that's the best mofong. I've only tried to make it like a handful of times, but that's pretty close to what I originally remember it tasting like. I have not had any wine, don't worry. I'm totally sober. Someone said it looks great. What's that? It said it looks great. Looks awesome. amazing. Yeah, I wish you could taste it. I know. So, like I said, I'll try and plan a little bit going forward on some of these. That way you can cook along if you'd like to cook along. The kale I'm just keeping pretty simple. I'm just, this is literally just coconut oil, left over from the plantains, and, um, and kale. I haven't added anything else to this yet. <clears throat> I gotta do some beans next. We're almost there. We've got our carbs, which is our plantains. Um, our beans are going to serve as our protein, and kale is going to be the veg. Oh, you know what would be awesome on this is cilantro. Wait, see, I have a bad habit of cooking with cast iron, so I turn this on out of habit. It preheat, but this heats up immediately, so I'm not going to turn it on. I'm going to... Someone said they love being on Twitch because they don't get to see dishes like this in England. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I'm glad you can see this kind of stuff. This is some really weird, weird stuff that we that I make here. So <laughs> if you want the actual, again, if, if you haven't seen this before, all the recipes do get posted to catchefkitchen.com. So when I cook live, I kind of wing it the whole time because I want everyone to see what it's like that you don't need to have a recipe always. Obviously recipes are great for learning. I learned with recipes, but what does cooking look like when you're not using a recipe? What does it look like when it's improvised, um, when things aren't totally planned out? This is what it's all about. And what is creative, what does different vegan food look like? What does food that doesn't incorporate meat look like? How do we make it really, really tasty and good and balanced? And, making us feel good. So this oils, you can see how whenever I say heat oil in a pan, it's it gets less viscous, it gets less thick, it's more watery. It's not as, it runs a lot more easily. I'm going to add the beans to the pan now. They said the weirder and more homemade the better. This is their favorite style of cooking. Awesome. <laughs> I agree. Free style. Yeah, so we just but added... Delicious. Pinto beans, these are canned pinto beans. I actually don't have that much fat. I don't have that much of an issue with canned beans. I know it seems weird to eat from a can, but they really are easy. Um, this kale's getting perfect. We're starting to see some of the brown and that crispiness. I love that, just getting a little bit of the crispiness so it's actually like crunchy and falls apart in your hands. It adds such a nice little flavor um, and a nice textural element to the dishes. The beans now I'm gonna flavor and I want these to kind of be, to, to go with the mofongo. Um, again, mofongo is more traditionally served, like I think the way I had it was with like a skirt steak or some sort of steak. Um, and it was just steak and like fried plantains and I like felt 
like, like totally weighed down and full after having it, but it was so tasty. So I want to make like a lighter version of this. And I am going to use seasonings <laughs> like uh, garlic, onion. Uh, I'm going to explain what I'm grabbing in just a minute. said cayenne. Cayenne? We can throw some cayenne in there. Why not? How about some chipotle too? Okay. Smoked okay. paprika. Smoked paprika. We could add some... Yeah, let's have some smoked paprika. Let's just add everything. Um, <laughs> okay. First couple things. I'm going to do my little glutamate trick. My, my savory trick which is always just a little bit of soy sauce. Not so much to flavor it, but just enough to add savoriness. So I'm just gonna add a tiny little splash of soy sauce. Hopefully we shouldn't really taste that at all. We don't want people to think, oh, this has soy sauce in it. And we're gonna add some nutritional yeast to add some more savoriness. This is our high protein fungus of the evening. <laughs> I know that probably makes it sound so appetizing, but I think mushrooms, like dried mushrooms, typically contain uh, proteins and amino acids like uh, guanulate, sodium guanulate, sodium iso something. I forget what the words are. I wrote about it. I did the research on Cash Chef Kitchen. These are the naturally occurring glutamates that add savory elements to dishes. Umami flavor? Umami flavor. Oh, nucleotides. Usually mushrooms have nucleotides. That's what the, uh, those words are that I just said. I, uh, gua sodium guanulate or something like that. Again, go to catchchefkitchen.com to read about what that is. But essentially, when you combine nucleotides, which again, I actually don't know that this is a good source of them. I have a hunch that it is because other dried mushrooms are, and this is a, a dried fungus, um, and glutamates, which soy sauce is scientific, like that's been shown. Combining these adds savoriness, which is meatiness, which is that makes it feel like there's more substance to the food. Um, so it's just a little trick to, to play on our palate to make it feel like we're eating something really substantial because when you're eating a lot of plant-based foods it's, it doesn't really feel that substantial always um, and we don't want to add um, we don't want to we want to keep everything natural uh, this is not what I want I'm gonna add a little bit of cumin now cumin and a little bit of oregano. These were some of my two favorite spices. Whenever I was, when I was first started cooking, these were the two that were my favorite. These were the two spices I would always keep on hand. If I had to have two, two spices, these are usually them. Um, now we're gonna add some chipotle and smoked paprika. These add smokiness. So this is kind of like gonna mimic maybe like the smoked, a smoked meat flavor. Um, without making this taste meaty. Chipotle's got some spice to it. Otto and I have no problem with spice. We love spice, so we add lots of spice. This is smoked paprika. This is a mild version of smokiness. It definitely is different than chipotle, but it also adds an element of smokiness. Somebody said add cayenne, so why not? I actually don't find that cayenne has very much flavor. It just adds a little bit more heat. Um, I'm just gonna add a little bit of garlic and onion powder just, cause, just for more flavor. So the, the selection of all these seasonings is really just based on flavors and my own playing around with all these flavorings and knowing or having a hunch as to what this is gonna make the dish taste like. 
I'm gonna leave things out that I think maybe don't belong in a dish like this. Like these typically all go together. I'm also gonna add crushed black pepper. Um, it's best to get the whole peppercorns and grind them like just right on the spot like that because when they buy pre-ground, they lose their potency. Um, maybe you won't, maybe you want it to be less potent. I, I, I like the, the potency of it because I, I can use less and make them go further. Um, but playing with seasonings is just really fun. Uh, there's certain things I, I wouldn't add. Like I don't want to add um, turmeric or ginger to this. It's going to detract from the way, the direction I want this dish to go. And flavors are a lot like memories. So if this was like a Puerto Rican dish um, and there's some elements of like, like I want to have flavors that remind me of being there, maybe not just Puerto Rico and Caribbean, but also like Mexican, um, like Southern California where we are, like those types of flavors. Those are all very different, of course, just very different ways to cook in all of those regions and different dishes and flavorings. But this is what comes to mind for me as the cook and as the creator. Um, there's no right and wrong when you're making your own dishes. This smells amazing. I didn't add any salt. These were lightly salted beans. They said low sodium. And I did add a little bit of soy sauce. So I'm not going to add any. Um, I like to salt on the table. I like to serve all food with a salt shaker and say just salt to taste. That way the people that are very sensitive to salt are happy with the food as it is and the people that like really salty food can salt as much as they want. But everyone wins. It's kind of like tacos. That's why tacos are like the perfect meal for serving when you have company over. Because you just make everything in little isolated things and people can just take whatever they want. So everyone can be happy. All right, I'm gonna taste this. It smells really good. It's also very hot. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, Kale, let's check on this guy. Some crispies. I love it with just like a little bit of burnt like that. Our mofongo is ready, has been ready. If you made this in advance or any of these things in advance, you just heat them on the stove real easily. Uh, we don't have a microwave. You could probably do things in a microwave too, um, but that is something that we do not have here. It is chaotic in here. Wow, okay. Plate it? We're gonna plate it now. We are gonna plate it. I was originally thinking of making a sauce. Mm. But this is like a sauce in itself. Would you agree, Autumn? Does this need a sauce? Mm -hmm. It tastes very rich and flavorful. That's so good. That is so good. I would tell you if something's not good, don't worry. Like, I know you would like, I'm not, there, I have nothing to try and improve here. It would actually probably be funny if I like made something and was like, this is disgusting, I can't believe I just made this um, <laughs> like that would be great that would be great video that would be a great video I think um, so I actually am enjoying this a lot maybe one day I'll just sabotage a dish no that wouldn't be good food should never be wasted like that what am I doing okay I probably could have added a little bit of water or something to this. Um, if I wanted it to be a little bit more together, like mashed potatoes or something creamy. But it's honestly so rich and it's so tasty the way it is that I just don't want to, I don't want to change it at all and I like it like this. Here's our, you know, I'm gonna do it all separate. I was originally gonna make a little base to build my food fort on, but here we go. A little bit of beans. Thank you for everyone that is still 
tuned in with us. This was just going to be a blue bread episode, but we we kind of figured we might as well just make it an actual episode too, because I had some fun things to cook tonight, um, and we had some time in between the cooling of the cabbage juices. Now we got that, and our kale chips. <laughs> Brock said, asked about the carb protein vegetable layering. Oh, so sometimes, so the only time you don't layer it that way is if you separate it all. So that's the other acceptable alternative is if you <laughs> don't, if you saw, I actually started piling my plantains, mofongo in the middle of the dish because I was going to build my food fort upon a foundation of plantains. Um, and then I thought about how this dish was originally served to me, and mine's doing multiple things at once as I was talking, and it was served with a pile of mofongo and like a piece of meat, and I liked, I really like each thing individually here, so instead of creating a fortress of food, I am creating a little community of of edible um, delights to pick and choose from. So this is the alternative. What isn't acceptable is if I put kale on the plate, then proceeded to put the mofongo on top of the kale and then the beans on top. That would be a disaster. Because then your kale, which is nice and crispy and the perfect texture, gets mushy. Um, if we built everything upon the beans, that's flawed because the beans are round and they roll around and then we just have a very <laughs> unstable fort of food. So the two proper ways of building food until I think of a third one that I have not thought of yet is carb, protein, veg, or separation of the, uh, and the community. <laughs> Brock says, fortress versus community, a whole new way of looking at dinner. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm here to do. I'm here to help you see dinner in new and fun and different ways. And I'm going to give this a shot. I don't talk about utensil selection often. Usually I just use a fork. In Bangladesh, apparently they use a spoon and knife, I learned. Um, I think that's also common in other parts of Southeast Asia. Um, the fork doesn't make an appearance, which kind of makes sense because you've got the knife which can do the stabby and the cutty, and then you've got the spoon that can scoop, whereas the fork can poke, but the knife can kind of poke too. Um, this, the fork can scoop, but the spoon does the better scooping job, so... But here, I like the forks, so... You can do chopsticks if you really want to... <laughs> learn to, I'm rambling on about this, but there's a good point to chopsticks. If you want to cut back on how much you eat, use chopsticks because it's so dang difficult to eat with chopsticks and they like, especially if you like eat rice or something like this, like you'd just be exhausted and you just don't want to eat anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so use chopsticks if you're working on portion control. Um, uh, I, I mean, the opposite side of that, use a really, really big spoon if you need to eat more and gain weight. So I'm gonna taste this, <laughs> see how it is. Kinda combine them all. Oh. Just gotta get a good piece here, there we go. Mm-hmm. I think this would just be great with some like hot sauce too. We got a few hot sauces in here. Oh, we got cilantro. Forgot about the cilantro. Maybe I'll just. <laughs> so, this is in a love mug. If you didn't already know, our filmer, my lovely assistant, um, Autumn, Autumn Love makes love mugs. They all have a beautiful graphic, our piece of artwork on the outside. 
and a beautiful little um, design on the bottom. It's very love oriented. Sorry, a lot of our, our cabinet paint chips off, so I was looking for one that doesn't have like a big piece of paint stuck to the bottom of it. So like here's a love a love mug with a cat. It's blue. There's a love on the bottom of it. This is all hand painted and resined. <laughs> Some of them even have glitter. They're very popular with the women. Look at that. Look at that glitter. Believe. <laughs> Seriously though, they are awesome mugs, but I just that was a little commercial for Autumn Love. Um, because I saw our cilantro was being contained by one. So maybe we just throw a couple little sprigs of cilantro on at the very end. This has been pre-washed, she claims. So I'll take her word for it. <laughs> and now, now we can really have, have a, a better taste. Mm -hmm. I might just add a little bit of salt. The salt pan appears to be on the table, but you got the gist of it. Salt's gonna be out. This is our dish. This is mofongo. And you saw the blue bread. Let's go take a look at the blue bread again, just to remind everyone. If you have no other reason to come back, this is, this is the reason to come back on Sunday. This lovely blue suspicious mush. I wish you could see how blue it is. It's much bluer than it looks on, on camera. Mm -hmm. But you can see a sample of how blue it is on my Instagram, the cat chef, at Cat Chef Kitchen. I've, I have made this before. It's blue like this grip tape on the skateboard. But Look anyways, how beautiful this is. That's a side, that's, that's Cat Chef Skate Shop. Um, <laughs> Anyways, we're gonna eat dinner. Thank you for tuning into this special episode on your Friday evening. And recipes will be posted on catchefkitchen.com. I'm several recipes behind there. I have to get on that. Maybe I'll do that tonight. I said that last week too. I will see you all on Sunday where we'll be making, I'm gonna email everyone if they want to get stuff. Um, maybe they'll plan on the coconut macaroon things, because those are really easy. Just, you don't even bake anything. Um, so, that's it. Um, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Your mom just says the Mofango would be good in a love mug, too. The Mofango would be good in a love mug. We're actually working on producing a video on how to use your love mug with pro athlete Lance Lynn, who is a professional <laughs> rewind skater. So, stay tuned for that entertaining video. That'll be on Autumn's art at Art by Autumn, her page. Thank you all for watching. Have a good night and see you all on Sunday. <laughs>